Vampire Weekend track. Uh, it's Greg Weiss uh, crushing the steel solo, and it's like I had to listen to it three times before I was like, "That's a steel," because it sounds like a guitar. He's like palm muting and stuff. Yeah. Sorry, I'm getting quirky. No, I'm just I forgot to hit record on the. Uh, oh, it's all right. We missed the whole first song. That's cool. And we'll, all our, our we'll play the whole banter. record again. Yeah, <laughs> we'll have to recreate our clever banter. That's all right. It hasn't been that clever. <laughs> At least not on my part. Well, uh, coffee's still gotta kick in there. So. Oh, yeah. Wish there was a way to do my overall level here. I'm just trying to make sure this doesn't go. I'm just super distorty. I think we'll be good. No. Oh, did I just. Like an idiot, did I just close? What happened here? Do we lose Facebook? Oh, no, 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 no. Because I'm on Google Chrome. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Good. Hello, everybody joining. We're, for those of you following along, we're entering track three. Let's make sure this did go through the, uh, go through the railroad page, okay? Well, I've been taking my life and hiding it. A bottle and an empty glass Till my face gets numb And I can't stand up Just two guys Just looking at the computer Yeah, right. We're good. Okay, we're right, bitch. Okay, cool. Yeah. <clears throat> so, um, listening to this, this is your first EP. Yes. Yeah. So, listening to this on the way over, uh, got five songs in here as this the cream of the, the, well they're great songs so don't take don't take this in a wrong context but is this the cream of the crop of a, of a broad catalog of songs or is this sort of you're getting started yeah with um well it's both yeah so I I started writing um, kind of as like a hobby you know I'm side man instrumentalist Same. guy my whole life um, and then the songwriting was just kind of like journaling but more fun yeah yeah know? yeah um, and uh, I think we got we put together seven or eight demos mm -hmm. and then picked five that's great so there are there are songs that were contenders for the EP that um haven't been fleshed out yet mm -hmm. and the songs you're hearing now were very different at the beginning of the process yeah yeah, yeah. Um, my producer joe velardi artist named joseph valentine great uh, songwriter lives in la now but used to live in that bedroom over there oh really wow <laughs> and uh he in the in the in the producing process was also really helpful in like refining the songs and like doing uh, supplemental like helping me with lyric edits and yeah, making yeah. sure the bridge is in the right place and it was extremely hands-on producing from the songwriting all the way to mixing that's great it was so see helpful. i had so this is this is cool because it, it it mirrors my same experience like same side man played bass you know it really just went like laser focus on the bass for like 10 years and after you do that and you find yourself in sort of a you have a niche as far as a scene or whatever there's only so much like practicing bass solos to the metronome only to play songs in a band that you're like you feel you're getting constru something constructive out so I started you know working on singing and writing songs and because like you said it was journaling and it was fun but you also see way more like a week of work you like noticeably better as yeah. opposed to when you're so far on your main instrument already it takes six months to notice any improvement yeah. and you're improving skills that you're probably not going to use yeah. with the with the as a side man yeah um, but my first EP, Tom Hamilton produced, and it was definitely the same thing. I just sent him a bunch of songs, and he was like, let's do these. And I was just like, 
pretend, yeah, pretend I'm a side man. Just tell me what to do. Mm. You know what I mean? And I, in it is it's good for people to know in this that you say that not because you're not creative or you don't know what to do, but you just get in your own head with your yeah. own things. You'll spend two years oh. like trying to make a decision yeah. where you need someone else to go. Oh no, this just needs that. This or this doesn't need yeah. that, or you know. Um, yeah, Gillian Welsh and David Rawlings work with producers. Yeah, right. And they're like the best. Yeah. You just like it, you got to get out of your head. Get out of your own. Well, head. or just having another set of ears on something is super valuable. Yeah. So, and that so I learned a lot from from Tom in that respect. Uh, and it's sort of to have also have a sort of fearlessness in the studio. I realized that like you know when you're learning that stuff, you can get really locked up too with equipment, uh, decisions about equipment or whatever. And he's like, like none of it matters. He's like using plugins. Like who cares? He's like plugging things in direct. Like it doesn't matter. He also took some time to get some really great sounds, but he also took some time to like just do some really fun things yeah. and not obsess over the the mic choice. Yeah. And that gave me a lot of freedom to start producing some of my own stuff. Do you think you're going to get into that zone? Oh, totally. We... And I've kind of already done that. Um, not only for myself, but for other people. Uh, like, making, making the demos for these tracks I was pretty much working alone mm-hmm. and then in the in the recording process I did a lot of the recording alone right I it was see. like Joe was kind of more doing like helping me get the arrangements together and um, he was there for mixing right and like really helping me get like you know just a little less reverb right there you know yeah, these, yeah. like creative moves that kind of you, Did know, you, you guys, it off. you guys wrote the line of s- too much slapback, just like the perfect. It was, it's like a laser sharp. You know, you guys lo- just nailed it. You know what I mean? <laughs> Thanks, man. There's um, like so much slapback that I can hear it, but not so much that I'm going like a little, a little abusive there. <laughs> that was, it was perfect. Yeah, it was mixed by Charlie Van Kirk, who's yeah. so good at his job. Yeah. Like mix is great brilliant well not only is the mix great it's like the to- some of the tones weren't right. going in and he you know there's several pretty aggressive fixes that ended up like better than if I was gonna you know go into a big fancy recording studio and yeah. record into a bunch of microphones from the 30s and yeah. you know, do the thing yeah, kind of the the concept behind this record was uh, I had saved up enough money to go into an okay studio for a couple weeks, and instead of doing that, uh, you decided to stay in your bedroom. Well, but I used I used the budget for you know like a mid level record in a studio to just buy some microphones. No, I get yeah. it. I totally get it. And I now totally I have them. I totally get it. I can it. do the next one for yeah. free. I totally get it. Other than, you know, all the other costs. Yeah. Making a record is very expensive. <laughs> well, it, no, it is. It is. Let's reiterate. Making a record is very expensive. <laughs> and uh, they don't get bought as much anymore. Um, but... It's fine. That's not. I'm actually embracing that side of things. It doesn't. No, me too. I don't. I don't get like beat up about. No, that is a record. Yeah. It's like you just make it the best you can for the least you can, and still have it be good. And, and yeah, because and focus on getting it to people. Yeah, you know, I, I think. I and don't get me wrong. They could be doing it in a more ethical fashion, but I think. Spotify and Apple Music and Tidal and Pandora are amazing resources. Yes, like, yeah. I can listen to any record I want right now. Right. You know? I mean, you it's used insane. to have to. You well, know. also, let's look at everything's relative, right? Mm-hmm. You know, uh, artists say they don't get paid a lot for Spotify and iTunes, and that is true, but it's more than we got paid for Napster. Yeah. <laughs> And also, like, I remember reading reading an article that said you needed 
800,000 streams a month to make minimum wage, which is crazy. Yeah. But that's passive income. Right. That's that's money you're making after you're done working. Yeah. Which, you know, while that's happening, you're probably on tour. Yeah. And you're probably making fine money. Yeah. Or you're playing in a bar and, you know, you make you can make a hundred dollars in a couple hours. Like it's just a part of it. Right. And I think the new there's like a new economy where people definitely are paying more to see shows. Oh yeah. And that's you know, that's the that's the thing that happened when we all decided that music was going to be free. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if any, but everyone was a part of that decision, but I, I'm into it. Well, you know what? I, I have a. We're about to get into a long Sorry, NPR. I got to pay the play the last track. Yeah, do it. We're about to get into a long NPR level dissertation on culture and music and business here. But um, uh, also, feel free to ask questions while I'm laying this. Do you know, you on, but. I thought about like you know you say people decided music would free what was going to be free I actually look at it a little bit differently I think when Napster came out it allowed people to pay the amount that music was really worth to them and this was at the height of pre-packaged I mean this was now you know from my era this is insane Britney Spears this is you know Creed this, you know what I mean Nickelback you know, in, sorry. in sorry records... Sorry for all you Creed fans out there. Yeah, the sorry. Sorry, not sorry. Hashtag, <laughs> you know, hash brown. Sorry, is not sorry. But, um, you know, this was the height of that. And record CDs were getting to be $18. That's like $25 in today's money, you know. And I remember being... My freshman year of college when Napster came out, people are drunk at a party. They're like, oh, I just want to hear that one song. Like, it was like, I just, like, people wanted, who hate Britney Spears, wanted to hear that one song when they were drunk. Or, like, hip hop, nothing, you know, I'm not trying to make an indictment on hip hop, for example, um, with this statement, but there would be hip hop songs where people just wanted to hear that one song from the radio. Why would you pay $18 to hear that one song? You know what I mean? It wasn't, it wasn't. But, so. There was that side of the industry where music was being made that didn't have a value in the old sense, in my opinion. But there were artists that were putting out music that did, that did have a value. And people were getting their music for free on Napster, but they were buying their concert tickets. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, like at the time it was Dave Matthews. Their first yeah. three records are amazing. And there's a lot of great musical content in there. And people would download them on Napster and travel all over to go to their shows. Whereas that one hip hop song and that one Britney Spears or whatever it was at the time, no one was going to those concerts that I knew. You know what I mean? Yeah. People uh, were probably going to those concerts, but it was like more um, marketed. Right. You know, like a, it's a different thing. Yeah, different and thing. I'm not, and again, I'm not disparaging anyone, but, you know, at the height of like, the commercial music business and commercial record sales it's like junk food you know what I mean yeah we were putting out something that didn't like just like junk food doesn't have a nutritional value commercial music at that time didn't have an artistic value yeah. so people felt like yeah the value's zero to me yeah. it's you know and Napster just came along and allowed them to pay what they thought it was worth mm-hmm. so well and the other thing is yes people were buying an $18 record at Walmart but in order to make that record, you needed a deal. You yeah. needed a big label to pay for it, and you needed to go into a studio. Yeah. In the 90s, yeah. hell yeah. Well, it took infrastructure to get it to people's doors. Yeah. I mean, we're, well, we're listening. You're, you're mailing your record to people right now on yeah. Facebook. Like, well, that's the thing, man. <laughs> that's, that's why... There's no semi. It's just coming right to your ears right That's now. why I'm completely pro-streaming service. Yeah. And I'm pro, you know, like right now with YouTube and Facebook Live and Spotify and uh, Patreon, somebody in the middle of Oklahoma has the same resource to get famous playing music Mm -hmm. than I do in a major city like New York or somebody in L.A. who meets the right... A&R guy or whatever, mm-hmm. however 
labels work. <laughs> but like, um, the the playing field is more even than it's ever been. Yeah, you know, it's you, more democratized. I mean, more bands. Let's get some more music popping. Uh, you can play it again if you want. All right. Um, yeah, I mean, more bands can have an actual career playing music. You might not be as rich, but there's more of. It's funny because. I mean, we're going to get into a whole other territory, but I feel there's there's a there's much more of a middle class in music now than there's ever been, which is ironic the way that that's <laughs> gone proportionally with with uh, you know with, with the world economy, whatever. We're not even going to go there, but yeah, no comment. Uh, yeah, I'm not going to go there, but, <laughs> but that's uh, actually a really really cool point. I had I just kind I'm, of I just totally agree with you. Yeah, I think you know I'm 26. I think I have a better chance in the music industry than I ever did, than I ever could have. Yeah. No, that's what I mean. There used to be no middle class. It was all super rich, label, you had a label, you had everything, management, or you were a local musician. Yeah, or you're, you know, struggling. Yeah. Now it's, there's so many people I know that are making a living playing music, original music. Yeah. You know? Uh, so we're going on about a lot of subjects here, but you guys can feel free to ask questions too. Anything you want. Just here chilling. How did I get here again? I'm stuck inside this motel room. Oh, so we're back to track number one here. Yeah, double play. Double play. The EP model. I like that too, though. Yeah, that's that's also kind of a phenomenon right now. I think. Yeah. I think. Well, more more music, more frequently, but not. You know what I mean? Not these yeah. big chunks. Like, I feel like I'll pose a question to people listening. Who listens to a full record? 12 track, back to back. People that don't spend their life driving down a highway. <laughs> oh, yeah. I already answered your question, Joe. 26. Just a just, baby. Just lost my health insurance. Yeah, just a thanks. baby. <laughs> just kidding. Now I'm on you know, government subsidized health insurance. So don't worry. It's all taken care of. Good. So I feel like the people watching this are deep music fans. Mm-hmm. Um, I, f- I feel like you're going to get zero answers of people saying they don't listen to whole records. <laughs> yeah. But... I, so yeah Kyle says it's all about the flow I feel like an EP can give you a record experience in less amount of time yeah. you know like I feel like the EP model um, is popular now because of people who want to hear a cohesive project that works together front to back it's true like most EPs you know so I'm also going back to you know the days of like even longer records there was always a few songs on there where you're like they were trying to make this an hour yeah this is filler you know you know but yeah like EPs it's all it's like so yours especially there's like one there's like one mood one you know what I mean and again I don't I don't mean that as like a detractor it's like it's it's intentional yeah I know and it shows but it makes it you can as short as an EP is I can get in that mood and I can stay there and enjoy it yeah I, I'm not I don't think I'm as good about that when I do an EP there's definitely more jumping around a little bit yeah. stylistically um, well that's also our problem as the the side yeah the side instrumentalist yeah you spend your whole life learning how to do like the chameleon thing yeah like oh well on this gig I am a bluegrass guitar player but then the next day oh yeah right the chameleon thing. no that's watermelon man yeah. <laughs> um you know, it's really easy for people like us to. You know, we, I know you want to do you, everything. You went to jazz, jazz, school, jazz bluegrass. You play, in a, you play in a jam band that plays a lot of bluegrass. Yeah. You know, I listen to a lot of electronic music because I grew up with electronic music yeah. the same as I did with jam bands and. Pew, pew, pew. Yeah, I know. Right, where's my? In- <laughs> I'm gonna have some effects on my little interface eventually. Yeah, there's, there's like you know I can do an air horn or something or I need to. I listen to a lot of electronic music. I still do. I still I still like electronic music, you know. Me too, man. And I use I use electronics to help me 
Make, like all these listening lounge tracks, half of them been done to virtual drummer, you know, and some of the virtual drummer stuff stays, you know. Let's see, yeah, there we go. Because um, it's about a mood, you know. There's times on tour where like I'm trying to get to sleep or something, and I listen to house music because it just puts me in a. It has this thing that I need. You know? Yeah. <laughs> There's no ups and downs, you know. It's just a flow and a, and a mood. Anyway, that's... The thing I was trying to avoid in making this was like... Yeah. Well, one of them could be a bluegrass song, and one of them could be like modern jazz. And I was like, okay, let's write these songs. The songs are all sort of about the same thing, you know. Uh, but that's it. But you know what? You the other reason I love the EP model, and this is something I'm getting to too now that I'm like compiling. You know, I've got some more songs sort of ready, uh, and I'm writing more than I ever have. Is doing EP like I want to do an EP that's more of bluegrass style. You know what I mean? I'm still gonna write my songs how I write them. Yeah. But instead of doing things like with drum set and more of a rock band thing. Get, get players that, you know, maybe we all play live and we'll do it in sort of a bluegrass format. Yeah. Just for one record. Well, that's you know? that's kind of like, I was just on tour with the Jacob Jolliffe Band, right. and other than Jake's record, which I'm sure some of the people listening listened on the last yeah. lounge, that music's insane, by the way. Yeah. Um, it's progressive bluegrass band, but he's also, um, he's also playing stroke songs and we played like a Franz Ferdinand song yeah. and he'll, he's got a, a Fogarty uh, Creedence Clearwater Revival tune he does but it's with a bluegrass band and it all yeah. sounds like bluegrass yeah. at the end of the day and it's like a cohesive thing and I think that stuff's really cool yeah. and it and it's easier to do five tracks like that for me obviously yeah. than to do 12 yeah like yeah. I don't think, un unless you have like Dark Side of the Moon done front to back, you should make a big long record. You know, mm -hmm. that's just an example. Charlie Moog, are you really? Are you being sarcastic, or are you really part of the part of the Moog family? I actually, to answer your question, I actually I I do own an actual Moog. I have the Moog Rogue. I bought probably 15 years ago for 130 dollars, and I use oh, it to yeah. play Moog bass. Uh, yeah, I love it. It's it's quite a force when you play it through an 810 cabinet. Um, so I just heard you say Moog and Moog. Mm -hmm. Settle the score, Charlie. How do you say your last name? <laughs> I don't know how you could type it other than the way you spell it. And Joe, what are you saying you missed? You missed that one. Which one? Which Which thing did you miss? Delay. <laughs> What's up, Jake? <laughs> oh, he missed the listening lounge with Jake. Oh yeah, it's it's on. Oh, so this is it's good that you asked, Joe, because all the I'm I record these separate with with my phone and stuff, and I put I put the whole I put the whole episode on YouTube, um, so you can watch every one I've done except for the very first one I did with Kevin. Um, they they're all on YouTube. Um, should be a little bit better video and in audio and stuff so um but you can also sure you can go back through my page and you can see the the facebook one but i feel like the quality is a little better on on youtube hey yeah uh my record is on spotify dad um andrew pointed that out earlier mm -hmm. there was a this, so this record came out yesterday and there was a slight delay with the certain streaming services mm -hmm. finally getting it on there but it is if you want to if you want to hear the record without me or Andrew talking the whole time it's on Spotify mm -hmm. the EP is called Clevidence and uh, my name is Mike Robinson which is in is, is that really your middle name? that's my name that's my middle name my name is Michael Clevidence Robinson what is what is the what the hell? It, where did that word come from? Uh, Sorry, my, Dad. I know Dad's listening. I'm just no. It's my mom's maiden name. Oh wow. Yeah. And uh, 
Yeah, I feel like Michael and Robinson are both super common. Yeah. So it's cool I have a weird one. Yeah. My mm. daughter's, I have a similar thing. My daughter's middle name is Fairfax. Nice. Yeah. She's got a pretty normal first and last name. <clears throat> and oh, it's a, fa- up, it's a family man? name. Family name as well. So, uh, the Emma who just commented, her older brother's in the Jake Jolliffe band. Oh, wow. Shout out, Miles Sloniker. Yeah. So yeah, that's Tally. Yeah. Tones. Tones. How many guitars did you play on this record? Mm, bad question. Um, five. And mostly... That's just, and if you count the pedal steel six, that's kind of a big, weird guitar. Yeah. Uh, mostly because uh, I re recorded a lot of the parts. Yeah. You know, and kept some of a take mm-hmm. that might have been on a Telecaster, but then I was like, uh, the second take would be on, you know, something with humbuckers. Yeah. And I would put both together. Right. It's like, oh, yeah. I guess both takes work. Pan them, and then it sounds good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and then with the acoustics, um, most of it's on this uh, super weird guitar. It's um, a 40s harmony, which is kind of like a student, like a cheaper mm-hmm. student type guitar. But the this guy in New York, great uh, luthier, guitar builder, guitar tech repair man, took the back off of it and took all the braces off because it's a ladder brace guitar and put an X brace like a Martin. And so it's pretty much the bones of a 40s Martin. Wow. But the body and look of a 40s harmony. Anyway, it's just dorky guitar shit. Can I say shit? <laughs> the bones <laughs> the bones of a martin <laughs> or whatever <laughs> or whatever i hear you dude hey gear it I'll, oh maddie's listening the from the other room <laughs> billy hey maddie <laughs> oh yeah there she is <laughs> oh, maddie hey. when are you putting out a record I'm just, I really know oh. where, I really know where this house is now, so it's like, you know, everybody should check out Maddie's band's record, Smoke and Ashes, Lonely Heartstring Band. I'm just getting used to just come back here. This is just the hot bed. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> we'll do one of these with Maddie too. Hargraves will probably have something to show you sometime soon. And by the time I get around the whole apartment, Jolliffe will have a he'll new have one a new record. Out. <laughs> oh my God, Brian. <laughs> Hi, Brian. <laughs> That's funny. Play, hit play. Oh, right. We got two more tracks. I'm playing the tracks separately on uh, QuickTime so we can have uncorrupted wave files. Yeah. Bis. <laughs> I can't even say it. <laughs> Uh, bespoke bit depth Bes- bespoke sample rates artisanal Ar- ha- artisanal bit depth artisanal handcrafted file yeah. extension. welcome to Brooklyn folks <laughs> oh thanks here, uh, we, here it goes yeah that's yeah here it it's goes. not gonna happen Brian no. it's cold maybe if it was summer We'd, he puts a record out in summer we'll do one on the back porch yeah, we don't, have, we don't have a porch. This is Brooklyn. Oh, yeah, right. Sorry. <laughs> Never mind. Barbed wire. Yeah, there is barbed wire out there. Yeah. But it's it's nice barbed wire. You got some doubled vocals here. Triple. Yeah. A little whisper track or something. You know? Yeah, there's one. There's one kind of, if we're talking about panning. There's one down the center for the whole thing, and then I did two hard pan for the choruses. Because I like Elliot Smith. What are you gonna do? 
bespoke vocal stacking. Exactly. Artisanal vocal panning. Okay, this is a long one. Read it aloud for, for Okay, me. so Susan says, Mike, I've seen you with the Jeff Austin band and enjoyed your playing, so I was pleasantly surprised to see you playing with Railroad Earth recently. Uh, can you tell us more about how that all came about? Any special moments? You were such a great fit with them. Thanks. Um, I had a very good time. It was it looks super, like you're wearing fun. a bowl of tie, by the way. Yeah, this is the this is the sure. Yeah, bowl of tie. Bowl of tie. Anyways, can, you were saying how awesome Railroad Earth is. Uh, I was saying how awesome <laughs> Railroad Earth is. Uh, I don't know. I I really got along with all those guys except for their bass player and. Um, <laughs> Okay. Um, it was it was a really really cool weekend, and um, they've been doing a lot of uh, special guests in the last few tours, and just happy to be a part of that. Susan knows as much as anyone. She's what? Susan, are you at two hundred shows now, or is it? I know you, I know you're at least a hundred, <laughs> or is it two hundred? She knows. She's she's probably seen almost every guest we've had. <laughs> probably. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I met. I guess the the connection was made uh, through my roommate Jake Jolly. Um He has a band with Tim, the Metropolitan Jamgrass Alliance, I think. Um, oh, two thirty. Yeah. That's pretty good. Sorry. Uh, and so, just through knowing Tim, I was able to connect with the guys and do a couple shows. It was very fun. A couple. How many are you playing coming up? <laughs> I'm allowed to talk about it. Tell the people. Uh, I am. I'm a. I think there's like 30 on the calendar that I'm yeah. doing. I'll be with them uh, through August. Mike. Yeah. Mike and Matt Slocum are going to join us <laughs> for uh, yeah the next five months. This the seven piece powerhouse railroad earth version. It'll be yeah. very fun. Yeah. It's, it's gonna be good. I agree with Joe. Yes. yes. Exclamation point. Yes. Yeah, that'll be that'll be super fun. Great, great players all around. It does take two to equal one Andy guessing, but Yes it does. Uh, probably more than two, yeah, honestly. Two two. <laughs> we need a horn section, we need yeah. a Yeah. I gotta I gotta start the lifelong quest of uh, reed instruments to really to really get inside that mind. Right. The eight piece orchestral armory. Oh man. Yeah, we had a Holly Bowling we had I, think was, I saw videos. Yeah, it was Holly Bowling and Lebo from ALO. But we also had Eric Yates was in town, oh, cool. so he ended up playing a lot with us too. So we had a pretty, pretty large ensemble. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah, must have been a must have been an epic. It was epic it was, hang. It was it was a good. Um, there were some good moments musically. Yeah, sure. I I did see some videos. Um, in so. I got the. Uh, the set lists, you know, for the stuff pretty far in advance, and uh, in preparing, I probably saw every Railroader YouTube that's on the internet, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> including those shows. Um, Dude, it's funny when, because I, I know what people are going through a little bit, because, you know, I, I joined the band at one point as well, and um, this was kind of... I mean, YouTube existed, but that's not really where people were going for music. I had to get everything off of archive. Oh, whoa. Yeah, yeah so <clears throat> that's that's worse and better. Mm -hmm. I when, I when I was playing with the Jeff Austin band, I learned all that music from two shows, just front to back. Mm -hmm. He pretty much, um, they had two shows from, like, very recently. Uh, I replaced uh, great guitarist Ross Martin in the Jeff Austin band, and so they had two shows that Ross played on. And the set lists were different enough that it almost covered the whole, wow. the whole book, to a point. You know, that you never know with Jeff; he can throw some stuff at you last minute, and then it's like you know, figure it out on stage, and it's very, very organic. And yeah. um, but I, 
loved having the continuity between songs yeah. learning off archive yeah. because that it's you know you kind of figure out how transitions work yeah and a lot of the time I figured out with the railroad stuff the transitions are different every time because it, it's like involved in the set list yeah 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 Yeah, I did a statistical breakdown of like, so once, so I auditioned for the band, then they asked me to do it, and the first run was like a three night run, and I learned 30 songs for the audition, um, but I wanted to have more for the, the first run, so I had 62 by the first run. And I, to figure out which ones to learn, I did like a statistical breakdown. I like analyzed this list for like the previous year to six months, and I prioritized the ones that were the most played. <laughs> it was pretty stupid. It's pretty nerd level. But that's math. that's important. Yeah. Not not just not just to uh, like learn learn the important ones, but knowing what the hits are yeah. was important for me yeah. just to not just to like pay careful attention yeah. I think like there's certain songs that require you know a more specific exact thing yeah. and those are usually you know popular with yeah. people yeah um, that's true that's true yeah cause there's yeah it, I mean that is totally true cause there's songs that I learned from the band where some of the lesser played things that are more simple that I, I never practiced it was like we just we just played it and it was like okay this is how this goes mm -hmm. and I had never listened well, to a single version of it in, in the case of Jeff Austin he has I know for a fact two songs that were written on stage mm -hmm. like cause he's got that you know yeah. free uh, kind of almost like free associated lyric writing thing he'll do like on stage wow. and then some of them stuck yeah. you know actually there's some railroad songs like that like um just so you know i don't know if we played that did you play that one with us just so uh, you know, it's in d it's a lot like feel and vibe wise i can feel a lot like any road but it's it's uh oh no no not any road i'm sorry it's a lot like it feels a lot like um the brian bromberg tune that we do uh what should we listen to New, new, uh, the EP is over twice. Hmm. What, what, what's some stuff you've been listening to lately that you like? Um, I'm I'm kind of a sucker for. Uh, you can mellow. also play the EP again if you want. You know. Huh. Play it on Spotify if you want to make a little money. Oh yeah, here. should I do that? Is it on here? Mike is going to listen to his own EP on Spotify for the very first time. There you go. <laughs> Play it again, man. I think it's I think it's cool. Let's see if the sound quality is any better or worse. Yeah, we don't have the artisanal files. Size. Lower bit depth. Yeah. It definitely sounds different. I think yeah, I have Spotify um, playing slightly quieter mm -hmm. because for all you audio dorks out there, Spotify uses a compressor mm -hmm. unless you turn it to the quietest setting mm -hmm. YouTube does the same thing now yeah mm -hmm. um, it's just so you can listen to records on your cell phone speaker and no, but, sound good. no but you know I, th I think it's smart that, that they're doing this because well actually you know who benefits from it is people like us yeah. you know because the old loudness wars of everyone trying to make their record stand out that was still happening you know and now you know we can make the dynamic music that people I guess want to make and we're not buried under a volume or from you know what I mean like our music will translate the same as as the pop artists um, which I think is which I think is nice sonically it's that not not a Vibe-wise, though, yeah, indirectly. No, 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 no. I don't know how to write about. But there is a su there's a subliminal. Topics. No, but there's a subliminal thing there that I think is is important. Like, totally. I feel like when people hear, you know, honest dynamic music, 
uh, af- you know, on a platform where they're used to being pounded, it sounds mm-hmm. like it sounds lifeless. Mm-hmm. You know, just because it's softer. When yeah. actually, it has more life and dynamics. Totally. You know, because it hasn't been squashed through compression. Yeah. Um, and then since everything's being leveled out, mm-hmm. you're, you're, you know, what I mean, the intimacy of this record can stand out after you just listen to, you know. Totally. Whatever, whatever else. And I think that all can be um, done with like a sensitive mastering engineer. Mm-hmm. Um, There's an interesting art. You would appreciate this because you appreciate um, some technical nerdy details of the craft. Compliments. <laughs> uh, there was a New York Times article that talks about this with the Grammys. They, they they went and analyzed, you know, the loudness level of songs and like versus like the, the greatest like you know the Eagles is still like the best selling record of all time and they showed its volume level versus like it's 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 overall dynamic level versus others and even in the modern era the longevity of people's careers to the dynamics in their music it was interesting they were they were putting a different spin on it that's not obviously not all that goes into oh, so career. like so like but, there's these one hit wonder uh, trap kind of artists that like have this thing that's just like Rah. yeah and they then, were trying to paint this narrative that like sure that music gets people's attention but it also makes them get tired of it faster whereas yeah but there was like numbers and stats behind yeah. it that was that was pretty cool I'll share with you. It was, it was an interesting group. Later, oh, Kyle. We'll, we'll see you on YouTube. <laughs> That's a jack. <laughs> yeah, man. Well, I hardly got to know you. Yeah, I think it does sound a little more compressed. Just a couple mm-hmm. Probably not. I'm probably just losing my mind. The way I understood it, and this could be wrong, was not that so much that they're they're compressing things. They're just well, maybe they are to get this effect. But it was like whatever the peak is, they're just putting everything to a certain level, mm-hmm. you know. But maybe they are compressing it to get it to have the same. Um, I, I understood it as they were just turning down the louder stuff, but maybe not. Interesting. Well, yeah, and I have it set like to quiet. I think. Um, but I do like not having to press play yeah. for every track. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Tell me, uh, tell us about the uh, the cover photo. Oh, um, hashtag shot on iPhone. <laughs> um, I my first EP the same thing. Yeah. Well, you know, so many parallels in our EPs, careers and music. EPs are on a budget, folks. Yeah. Isn't streaming on Spotify as MP3? I think you can pick because Spotify has both types of files. Um, when you offline, you can pick if you want a lossless file or not. Wow, that's cool. That must be new. Yeah, I think it is because Tidal does that. And they were like, yeah, that's awesome. That's new because um, when I haven't, I haven't kept up with some of the advancements. I listen to Spotify on my phone, but I haven't. I, but I remember when it first came out, and I was looking at the settings. You could pick higher quality settings, yeah. but the higher quality was like 320 MP3 still. It yeah. wasn't like... So maybe it's still MP3. Um, I know That on, was years ago, though. I know on Tidal, because I've done this with like my mixing engineer uh, buddies, where you go into their listening position with these amazing speakers, and you go on Tidal and you listen to the lossless like masters on Tidal. Like, we listen to uh, Paul McCartney ram on. That record sounds incredible. And I never really noticed until I listened to the... Uh, uh, like, in a good listening position with the lossless files and stuff. How much of it will you be playing today? How much of what? Yeah, you know what I like to use for the uh, the high end listening stuff is uh, hdtracks.com. If you go there, no. Yeah, you can buy. I mean, you have to pay for the record, but you can buy mm-hmm. the high res, like 24 bit even. Heck yeah. And I do that sometimes for reference mixes when I'm working on my own music. That's 
smart. I have a variety of stuff, you know, some some classic records, but also new records that I love, like some Wilco stuff, or that the Daft Punk record that came out a number of years ago, which I really liked. I have those at high res, but also you know, like some Tom Petty or Grateful Dead, Bob Dylan, you know, all kinds of stuff. Yeah, and it, I, I think it's more or less important depending on how the record was made. Like, I don't mind listening to, you know, say like a live album um, as an MP3. Right. And, you know, you can't really tell until you're listening in like really great headphones right. or a really good stereo. Right. But. And you almost can't even tell until you do it back to back, even. You know, totally. If someone, if you play someone an MP3 and then a 24-bit file, they're like, mm-hmm. oh. But if you just put something on casually, yeah. ask them which bit depth it is, you're like, oh. No. It's either a good record or it sucks. Yeah. Um, yeah, like records that are classically known to sound incredible, like any of the Beatles EMI mm-hmm. stuff that's just like... Yeah. Um, I remember, yeah, comparing, I, this is, you know, I'm sure there's Beatles fans out there that are going to make fun of me, but I can't remember what Beatles record it was, but the Beatles record that came out the same year as Pet Sounds, and how bad Pet Sounds sounded next to it. Just but see, like, it's so funny, because Pet Sounds is touted as a yeah, classic record. It's supposed to That's be like, like a reference mix yeah, record. it's supposed to be like one of the best sounding records, yeah. but like, for the time... England was doing it better. Yeah. Yep. That's true. I think Pet Sounds is one of the most creative records ever. Mm-hmm. And like, what they did with it was incredible. But... See, Motown is my jam from that era. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that shit sounds good. I love that stuff. Uh, Maddie, my roommate, was just telling me about the, uh, the preamp mm-hmm. they made for Jamerson. And uh, all the electric how... instruments. Yeah. The way I understood is there was like four, and they were just like, basically like maxed out they had like almost like no volume control or something mm-hmm. and they all the volume was adjusted on your actual volume knob yeah which affects your sound too that's part of it you know, um, you know from playing electric guitar totally yeah. um yeah that was always like <laughs> you know uh you have somebody sitting next to the amp and you're like okay turn the amp up half a number and i'll turn this down yeah. and i'll go like half a tone you know just yeah. getting the exact yeah, right. guitar tone you want you're right. But, um. I feel like. I don't know. What were we talking about? Pet Sounds? Yeah. And then Motown. And then. Oh, right. So, Maddie was saying that, um. There was, like, a preamp that they made. Like, they built it. Yeah. And now there's, like, all these boutique high-end builders that build the, like, circuit that they were really? using for the Jamerson. I gotta game. get me one of those. Yeah, right? Yeah. Talk to her. Um, got a new P bass that I've been uh, getting worked on right now. It's, I got my 60s P pickup, you know. Uh-oh. I got my... Oh. Why did that happen? Oh, you know what might have happened? What? Sometimes if it recognizes, because this is an actual release, yeah. and you're not allowed to use it technically. Oh. Mm. Lame. Well, I don't think it makes sense to go back on. I'm that's allowed it. to use it. I know, that's where this technology kind of sucks and gets fucked up sometimes. Yeah. It's funny you didn't say anything when we were just playing the... It's alright, you can throw in at the end. Lost the feed. Yeah. Still live here. Oh, good. Well, I shouldn't have paused the record then. We're not live, no, but it doesn't matter. It's over now. Um, I wonder if that's what happened. So It'll tell me later. It'll be like... I'll get a notification saying, You used unlicensed... Say yes if you have permission, you know, or we'll mute and we'll mute the sections that whatever. Yeah. That's why it's also good for me to do it this way for the YouTube stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Although YouTube might mute it too for all I know. Well. Well, anyways, we reached our hour mark. Yeah, Anyhow. we did it. I don't know if there was something else going on, though. If it was just a bug or something, we'll find out. 
Hmm, that's interesting, yeah. I can't remember if we played Jake's. Speaking of. I can't remember if we played Jake's um, record off of files like this or if we played it off Spotify I'm or something. Almost certain you played it off Spotify. Yeah. Because that dude it. doesn't own a computer. <laughs> right? We talked about that actually. And and he once said, Hey, can you burn my C D to to like create AIFF audio files and put them in a Dropbox and send it to me? Like he didn't he doesn't have audio files yeah. of his own record. <laughs> Hopefully we're still on YouTube. <laughs> oh god, I love this. Love you, uh, Jake. <laughs> no, we we are. I'm gonna cut that up. So good. We got we got plenty of Jake jabs in there though. <laughs> we got some good stuff in good. there. Good.